Hi, everyone. I'm Steph. And I'm Lisa. And together we're PD Connect. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and intro uh, Dr. Bradley McDaniels. Dr. Bradley McDaniels is an assistant professor and program coordinator for the Rehabilitation Studies Program in the Department of Rehabilitation and Health Services at the University of North Texas. Brad earned his PhD from the University of Kentucky and after graduated, and after graduating, completed a postdoctoral research fellowship in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in the School of Medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University, focus, focusing exclusively on Parkinson's disease. That was a mouthful. Amazing. <laughs> okay. Brad's entrance into PD world was precipitated by his mother's diagnosis in 2012. Brad is currently involved in research focusing on meaning in life, loneliness, demoralization, stigma, and other non-motor issues of PD. Thank you for joining us, and we're so happy to have you here today. Thank you for the intro. Nice to be here. Let's see. Let me find some slides here, and we will get rolling. Uh-oh. Underway. Can y'all see these? No, not good. Nope. Try again. Here we go. How about now? Good. All right. So as Steph so aptly said, you guys heard a little bit about me. Um, you know, one of the areas that I've kind of just recently kind of delved into and gotten interested in is this concept of demoralization. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that is. Uh, in a minute, but I thought I would share a couple of things before we dig into the presentation. So here's, these are kind of some objectives, some things I hope that you walk away from this presentation with at least a cursory understanding of, and hopefully you'll be able to talk about what demoralization is and why do we even care about it. Um, understand the impact of apathy and demoralization on people with PD. Define meaning in life and the role that it plays in health outcomes. And probably the most important thing is identify steps you can take to improve meaning in life that will help these two areas that a lot of folks struggle with. So um, with that said, well, let's go to this screen. Um, a little bit about me. You kind of heard that. I spent 18 years in the pharmaceutical industry um, and my mom was diagnosed 11, about 11 years ago now with PD and I was at a place where I thought, you know, I wish I could do something to help my mom. And at 41-ish, uh, I was too old to go to medical school. I thought, you know, go to medical school, be a neurologist is a long road. And I kind of serendipitously fell into the Parkinson or the uh, rehabilitation psychology, rehabilitation counseling, all of that fun stuff. And um, decided I wanted just to do things to help my mom's quality of life while she battled Parkinson's, as you guys all know. And just a little bit more about what Steph said. I focus on the neuropsychiatric features of PD mainly. Uh, I've done a fair amount of writing. I do a lot of work with Indu Subramanian, who I think many of you know well. Um, she and I are pretty close and do a lot together. She and I and uh, Greg Pontone, who is a geriatric psychiatrist from Johns Hopkins. And we've done some work with loneliness, uh, we looking at done work with meaning in life and apathy, and uh, we've just got a couple of other new papers accepted looking at some of the neuropsychiatric challenges of early diagnosis and mid-diagnosis of PD. So we're kind of working in this field, in this area, trying to find things that will hopefully make someone's life a little bit better. So that kind of gives you a little idea about me. So this is something that I think you all know well. Right. So we get this new diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Now what? Right. You go into your your movement disorder doc's office and many people have a, have an idea already that, you know, your primary care doc may have said, hey, I think maybe you have Parkinson's. You've got this tremor in your hand or you've got some gait instability or slowness. And but you finally get in with a movement disorder doc and they say, I think you have Parkinson's disease. Um, I can just tell you coming from my mom's perspective and many that I talk to, everything stops in that moment, right? I'll, you hear Parkinson's disease and you go, I don't even know what it is and what does that mean and how's that going to affect my life? And a lot of these other things happen. 
you get this feeling life is over as I know it. Maybe you're employed and you begin to think, am I going to be able to maintain my employment? Could be that um, we talk about work. What about relationships, right? Potential role changes in a family. If you're the primary breadwinner in our family and you're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, how's that going to affect that? How's that going to affect my relation, my social relationships with people in the community, things that I used to do or like to do for fun? Are those things going to be impacted? Potentially. Again, family roles, somebody who takes care of the house, somebody who takes care of the yard, somebody who takes care of the kids, right? Especially for those who are diagnosed earlier in life, you know, the young onset community at less than 50, many of that, those in that community have kids at home. What do we do now? Somebody's still got to do those things. Social functioning. Can I, maybe you're involved in exercise pre pd Can I maintain that once I'm diagnosed? Can I continue to, I'm involved in dancing, let's say. Can I continue to do these fun things that I did before? And what about my meaning in life, right? Research indicates that anytime there's a traumatic life event, there's likely to be changes in one's meaning in life. And you'll see throughout this talk, meaning in life is a, is a constant. Um, it's something that I think when you walk away from this, you'll realize how incredibly value, valuable having meaning in life is. And we're going to spend some time on that. So we get so someone gets diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. What are the outcomes? Reactive depression, right? Right at that moment, you begin to have feelings of depression. Those, my life is over. What am I going to do now? I can't do the things for fun that I used to do. And um, that's known in the medical community as reactive depression. It's very different from a formal diagnosis of something like major depressive disorder, but it's nonetheless still um, capable of negatively impacting one's life. So that's one possible. Anxiety, right? Beginning to have those questions, what now? What am I going to do? How long am I going to live? What's this going to do to my functioning? All of these things that crop up. Uncertainty, right? Uncer everything's going to change in my life now. How long is it going to be? Is it going to be one year, five year, 10 years? We don't know. And I think those of you who are on here know enough about Parkinson's disease to know that it differs for everyone. Um, 10 years in is not the same for patient A as it is for patient B, necessarily. So we don't know. Maybe anger. Anger is a common reaction when, when uh, traumatic events happen. Um, why, why did this happen to me? Um, again, going back to that whole my life is over thing. And uh, it's not fair. And now what am I going to do? I'm going to lose friends. You know, all of these negative thoughts that seem to uh, go through our heads. Apathy, right? Apathy, I think, is something that most people who have Parkinson's disease have experienced at some point in their life, at least the literature is pretty clear that the vast majority of people uh, have experienced some apathy. And we're going to spend a little bit talking about that uh, more in depth. Experiential avoidance, where you just don't want to go out. And we're working on a paper right now that's talking about stigma in Parkinson's disease. And I think there's a strong correlation between experiential avoidance and feelings of stigma that people are judging you, right? Because you're out in a social setting and you have tremor. What's someone think? Maybe because you have masked fac facial expressions, uh, people think something's wrong with you, that you're not interested in communicating with them, right? And so we begin to be really conscious about what's going on with our bodies. And does that affect us going out and engaging with the community? I think it does. And certainly in talking to a lot of people with PD, I think that's a common struggle. Add in this season we just got out of, right? COVID. COVID changed everything. You guys know this, right? Feeling stuck. We had this lockdown. Everybody's hole up in their house. We can't leave. You know, thank goodness that we did have things like we're on now with Zoom, right? That allowed us to continue to connect with people in our communities, but it's not the same. It's just not the same as having personal one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face interaction. So we feel stuck. Oh, complacency, right? 
everything is, nothing's changing. I'm doing the same thing, kind of that groundhog day mentality, right? I'm just, I'm going to sit in my house and do the same thing today I did yesterday. Fear, fear of getting COVID is real, right? There were a lot of negative outcomes resulting from uh, someone getting COVID. Um, the fear about vaccines, the, I, I mean, there was so much fear that's been perpetuated in the media, some of it true, some of it not true. But then how do we determine what is true, right? It's really hard to tease all of that out and figure out what's going on. Discomfort, right? We know that motor symptoms got worse during COVID for people with Parkinson's disease. Literature is pretty clear about that. So does that affect my comfort? I would say it probably does. Right, your tremor got worse. Maybe your your slowness got worse. You became more stiff. Uh, it affects your comfort. Certainly, depression. Right, depression just being again locked up in your house for weeks on end, and maybe only having phone conversations or Zoom conversations with people. Um, we got lonely, and uh, loneliness. <laughs> you know the effects of loneliness in some of the literature talk about they are as great as the effect of someone who's got substance use disorder, smokes, and obesity combined. And that's pretty impressive understanding. And that's where we as a society were for nearly two years, right? So we were stuck in this loneliness and demoralization, right? So all of this I've been sharing with you up to this point is leading us into you can see that there's this negative cascade of emotions and feelings that happen once someone is diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And um, we've got to figure out how do we deal with it? I think the medical community at large, movement disorder specialists are fairly good at dealing with depression um, when they treat it. The literature talks about only 50% only of people with Parkinson's disease when they visit their movement disorder docs are asked about their mental health. Only half, right? That's problematic. So what do, what do you do if you're not asked, right? Do you just struggle with it? Uh, ends up having a lot of problems, right? So what is demoralization? Best definition, simple definition is the inability to cope with a pressing problem. So you've got this diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And everything in your life changes and you don't know how to cope with it. And it just leads to these symptoms that are very similar to depression, but yet distinct. And we'll talk about that as we go. So symptoms include helplessness. I have no idea what to do. I've got this new diagnosis. I really don't understand what it is. I'm kind of learning about it, but there's really nothing that they can do. They can treat the symptoms a little bit, but we don't have disease modifying therapies yet. And so what's going to happen? I don't know. What can I do to help it? It's initial reaction, hopelessness, right? Because it's a chronic degenerative neurologic condition, it's not going to get better over time, right? It's only going to progress. And because of that, we begin to feel like what am I going to do? It's just going to get worse over time. And I'm not going to be able to, um, to function the way that I used to function. Meaninglessness. You know, I talked a couple of slides ago about when someone experiences a traumatic event, they lose meaning in life. <clears throat> and that's a common thing that we see with chronic conditions, particularly chronic neurologic conditions is, um, what am I going to do now? What is my meaning in my life? And um, when that's lost, the literature is clear that there are a lot of negative things that happen. And a couple slides in, you're going to see what those things are. Subjective incompetence. Now, Jerome Frank was a researcher back in the 60s, and he was the guy who came up with this term demoralization. And what it you know, incompetent seems like a, a, a pejorative negative word, right? And it doesn't mean something's wrong with you in, in that way that you don't understand something necessarily. It just means that the coping skills that I have are not able to help me deal with this problem. So in other words, if Frank would say you are incompetent to deal with what's going on in your world right now. And that's really the 
those four things are the distinguishing factors of demoralization and between that and depression. It, it can result in diminished self-esteem and self-efficacy. Two other things that we know are strongly associated with positive outcomes. You know, self-efficacy says, I think I can do it. So pull that into someone who's in an exercise group, right? If you don't think you can do it, odds are you can't. And you probably won't go versus the person who says, I don't know, I'm going to try. I think I can. And I go do it. And you figure out that there are some things that you can do. And some of that comes from just trial and error, right? It's scary to try new things. But there's also the other side of that. You try something new, you learn a new skill, you feel good about yourself, your self-efficacy rises, and now all of a sudden you're able to do things that you didn't think you could do before. And then your self-esteem goes up because you begin to feel good about who you are. Those things all end up helping the way that we feel subjectively. So we talk about coping and there's a, a huge literature that describes a variety of of coping strategies and ways that people cope. There really are two kinds of coping that people really focus on. Problem-focused coping, which is I'm focused on this problem that I have and I wanna to try to solve it. I wanna get as much information as I can to help me become more knowledgeable about it so that I know what things I need to do in my life to improve it. For instance, exercise, right? You begin to learn about Parkinson's disease. And you realize that exercise is a critical piece of treating your Parkinson's. So that's problem-focused coping. I'm coping with the problem by engaging in exercise, taking my medicine, going to my appointments, engaging with others in social situations. Um, so then there's emotion-focused coping, which most people would argue is not as effective because emotion-focused coping is a way that we just seek to escape from dealing with the problem. And probably the best example of emotion-focused coping is the use of substances, right? You drink a lot of alcohol, you don't have to deal with your problem that you're having right now, Parkinson's disease, right? Until the alcohol wears off, and then you're back to the way you are and your problem is still there and it hasn't changed. And so, it's always best, typically best, to have a problem-focused approach. And these are things that Jerome Frank talked about as he was going through his research. And, um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of literature on coping, but I think if we just keep it simple on these two, it makes more sense as we go along. When insufficient, distress and helplessness ensue. So when my coping strategies that I have aren't working, I get distressed and I feel hopeless and helpless, right? So I say, um, let's say that I, I believe that I need to exercise for my Parkinson's disease. And I go to exercise class three days a week. And I keep doing that over time, over time, over time, nothing gets better. You can see how you would begin to feel helpless, hopeless, and have distress, right? You're saying, I'm doing the things that I'm supposed to do but I'm not getting the results that people tell me I'm going to get. And so that's kind of how this coping mechanism works and how it influences our feelings, our demoralization, and uh, can lead into a true state of depression as you go along. So as I mentioned a minute ago, probably the biggest challenge that providers see is differentiating demoralization from depression. And there are a variety of inventories, uh, probably the best known is the Beck Depression Inventory that medical people will give to patients to make a determination, does this individual actually have depression? You answer these questions in a survey, you add up all the questions and you get a score. And how does that differ from demoralization? Well, there's also a scale for demoralization uh, it's not used much um, any, anywhere outside of the cancer literature. That's where you typically find this construct of demoralization. And it's when people have incurable cancer and they're nearing the end of life. That's when this, this true demoralization was discovered. And, um, but I think the easiest way to differentiate the two 
is we talked about demoralization being a subjective incompetence, meaning I no longer have the coping skills that I need to deal with problem X. Here it's Parkinson's disease. It could be the loss of a spouse. It could be the loss of my job, right? I just don't have the skills to deal with this change that life's thrown at me. Versus depression, the main distinguishing feature of that is anhedonia, which means the inability to, inability to experience pleasure in anything. Just that everything stinks, it's terrible, nothing makes me feel good, and it's not worth continuing on, right? That's kind of the difference between the two. So why are we talking about demoralization, right? So clearly, we understand that there's this traumatic event that happens with a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. That's simple enough. We talked at the beginning a little bit about these changes in social roles derives, derive, deprives us of avenues for satisfaction and competence, right? So we have friends that we engage with right in our lives. Like I said, you maybe have a dance group, an exercise group, a social club you play cards with. All of a sudden, you get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and maybe those group relationships change. Maybe you begin to pull back because of the potential stigma that's associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, you know, another one that stands out I didn't mention earlier is incontinence right? The problem that that creates for people with Parkinson's disease who want to go out in society and engage, I'm going to go to dinner with some friends, but ooh, what if, right? That's a big concern. I'm going to have to get in a car and drive for 45 minutes to get somewhere. Ooh, what happens now? What happens if, thing, if I become incontinent in the car, right? So those things begin to affect whether or not we engage and continue doing the things we enjoy doing in life. And, you know, the other component of demoralization is it's when you appraise your situation, right? You make a judgment, a value judgment on the situation that you have, i.e. Parkinson's disease, and you view it as hopeless. I think it's a fair statement to say Parkinson's disease isn't going anywhere anytime soon, right? But it doesn't mean that we're not coming up with things on a regular basis that can help improve quality of life and make living with Parkinson's disease more bearable, better, um, not as challenging, right? Challenges are still going to exist, but we've got things that are improving. There's virtually been nothing done on demoralization in Parkinson's disease, and it's fascinating. I know we've got a paper that we're getting ready to start looking at this, this thing and, and kind of begin to bring it into existence, so this term becomes somewhat of a norm and that doctors begin to understand that it's not always depression that someone has. It could just be this demoralization. I don't know how to cope with the problem that I'm dealing with and therefore I feel negative. So that's probably a new term for most of you. Um, apathy, I would bet is probably not. I would bet that you've heard this and we're gonna roll through this a little quicker. It's a very common neuropsychiatric syndrome in people with PD. And really, it's defined as a loss of goal-directed behavior and motivation. It's that thing that says, you know what? I've got exercise today at 1 o'clock. I just don't feel like going. It's apathy. Uh, I need to cook dinner for my spouse. Eh, I just don't feel like doing it. Apathy, right? It's just that ah, I just can't seem to get off the couch or get out of my chair. Or, you know, my friends want to go to lunch. And I'm like, nah, I... I just, I'm not going to go, right? That's apathy, just no motivation to do things. And it, it's a challenging uh, syndrome to diagnose because the symptoms can be very similar to depression, right? Depre people who are depressed frequently don't want to leave the house either. They feel bad. They don't feel like getting up. And, and the catch-22 is for exercise, for instance, right? One of the things that can be prescribed for someone who's depressed is to get out and exercise. But the problem is getting them up and out to do it, to begin to help fix the problem. So it, it's really challenging. Dementia and depression can commonly overlap with apathy. 
So again, doctors are, you know, frequently you're going to be, you might be sent to a, a neuropsychiatrist to a uh, neuropsychologist rather to diagnose this problem or a psychiatrist to actually um, begin to treat it. How prevalent is it? Some studies show up to 70% of people with Parkinson's experience apathy. I think if you look broadly at the literature, it's more around the 45% range is, a, is an average. But nonetheless, I show that because that's a lot. That's a lot of people who experience this. And more importantly, there's no treatment for apathy, right? If you talk to a movement disorder doc and you say, what do you do with apathy? Most of them say, I don't know. I try cholinesterase inhibitors. I try SNRI antidepressants. I try SSRI antidepressants. I try more dopamine, right? There are a variety of things. Some work, some don't for some patients, but there's no rhyme or reason to why. And so that becomes the challenge when you've got a syndrome that's this common, but you don't know how to treat it. Doctor's hands are tied. Among the most common factors negatively affecting health-related quality of life. The, so you've got mobility, psychosocial functioning, depression, and apathy are the top four things that people with Parkinson's disease report are the things that most negatively affect their quality of life. So it's up there right? It's a, it's, a, it's a big deal that we need to talk about. And there's some data that show that it pred predicts cognitive decline in people with PD later. So if you have apathy early on, there's some data that says there's a relationship between that and developing dementia later in life. So it's an important neuropsychiatric feature that I, I think it's worthwhile to begin to take time to, um, to figure out what do we do with it. So this is kind of where, where my research comes in. Um, I've been a fan of this guy, Viktor Frankl, for a long time. He was an uh, uh, Austrian psychiatrist back in World War II during the, great, or during the time when the Germans had uh, Nazi concentration camps, right? And he and his family were captured and put into Auschwitz in Germany. And everyone in his family died except him. They were sent off to other camps. He spent a total of four years in concentration camps at three different camps. And he developed this idea that people who have meaning and purpose lived, those who didn't died. And he watched this over and over. And he, he said when he got out of there that that was his goal was to bring what he learned during these camps to everyone else as a way of dealing with life struggles. So here are some quotes that Viktor Frankl said, when we're no longer able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves, right? We can't change Parkinson's disease, right? Nothing anybody can do to change it. So what, what are our options? We have to change our view of it, right? Those who have a why to live for can bear almost any how. The why is your purpose. Why do you continue to push forward in your life? Um, why does your life matter? And if you, and that was his thing. He said he had a purpose in life that when he got out of this concentration camp, he was going to help people change their lives. That was his why. So he could deal with all of the negative treatment and consequences that existed while in that concentration camp to get through. In some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment one finds meaning, right? So all of a sudden, this stuff that I'm focused on in my life, all of the negative things that are happening, isn't so bad once I realize what my meaning and purpose is. It's important to find that. And then lastly, striving to find meaning is, is one's in one's life is the primary motivational force in man. He believes that everybody on the inside has an instinctual desire to define meaning in their lives, right? All right. So quickly, this is a quick slide here. So I, I was always curious, right? So we're talking about meaning in life. And is it something that's like this idea that nobody's talking about? And I'm just some researcher who wants to bring it to the, the forefront? Not quite. Because when we look at Google, I just looked on Google Scholar, which is a place you find research, right? 
I typed in quality of life and there were 5.9 million hits in quality of life from 2016 to today. But there were also 4.5 million results for meaning in life. 4.1 million for depression, only 774 for Parkinson's disease. That's significant, right? That many studies in meaning in life. And most of those are in the last decade. Uh, prior to that, there was very little done. There have been a few researchers around the world. Um, Michael Steger from Colorado State, maybe the most widely known meaning in life researcher. Um, Crystal Park from University of Connecticut is another. So there are some people who have been spending their careers talking about this. So I'm talking about meaning in life, not meaning of life, right? Those are two different questions. Meaning of life is kind of this existential question of why are we here on earth? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, right? And more importantly, that's really difficult to study. But meaning in life is what is my meaning? What is my purpose in being here as a friend, a parent, a spouse, an employee, a physician, whatever, right? What is my meaning and purpose? And what we find out that there are these, these domain levels of meaning, which look at where do people find meaning in life? If you look at the literature across the board, there are three things that are common to most meaning in life papers, spirituality, relationships, and work. Those are the top three areas. Think about your own life. What is it that gives your life meaning? It could be your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors, your spouse, a relationship with a higher power, however you define that, right? Those things are important and work, right? And so we see the problem that occurs that you get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. The average age is 62, right? So we'll say you get diagnosed in your mid-60s and you've got a job, and all of a sudden now you begin to have some issues and you have to retire from your work before you're ready. So now that you've got one area of meaning that may be gone, how's that going to affect your relationships? You might have some working relationships that are no longer going to be part of your life anymore. So now you've got two areas of meaning in life that are gone. And so you can see how this can become problematic over time. And uh, we talked about this a minute ago. Research indicates traumatic life events can lead to changes in meaning. We know this to be true. A clear sense of meaning and purpose can add something positive to your life, regardless of your health situation. And there's a ton of research on meaning in life. And I'm going to share with you quickly after this one. So there are three things that make up meaning in life, right? The question probably may be, how do you define meaning in life and how do you measure it, right? Because we can't research something we can't measure. So the first area is significance. Do I feel like my life has value? Does it matter that I'm even here anymore, right? So that one of the three things is significance that's important, comprehension and coherence. I understand myself within the context of my life. My life pretty much makes sense with how I view the world, how I view people around me. Yeah, you know, you get dealt a bad hand at times, but by and large, I can see my life and it makes sense. And I know my place in the world. And the last one is purpose. I have valued goals in my life. I have something that I'm striving to achieve. And we look at those three things. And when someone can positively report those three, they will have higher scores and meaning in life. And there are several measures that are used um, to measure this. And so they're all validated. And so we're, we're getting a better feel for what this looks like. So here's kind of the money question. Why does it matter? Right? So here's some quick ones. Higher meaning in life is associated with more positive emotions, positive personality traits, right? Extroversion, agreeableness, optimism, those types of things. More life satisfaction, better self-esteem and self-worth, positive coping, hope, optimism, resilience, better health-related quality of life, better well-being, more successful aging, and it's associated with less 
physical decline and slower cognitive decline in older adults associated with less PTSD, less hypertension, less negative affect, right? Negative mood, feeling sad, less depression, less anxiety, less suicidal ideation, less substance abuse, less need for therapy, and lower mortality, right? So if, if I go back to look at, at this slide, I would say everybody on here would love to have all of these things get better in their life. No question about it, right? And you would like to see all of these things go down. Then add lower mortality. So there have been studies they looked at. Patricia Boyle did a study back in, I think, 2009. She looked at two groups, older adults. And the first group was the highest 10% scores of meaning in life versus the lowest 10% scores of meaning in life. She controlled for all confounding variables, age, other diagnosis, depression, anxiety, all of those things. The end of five years, there was a 56% decrease in mortality rate among the group that had the highest meaning in life scores. That's pretty good, right? There's not much else that we can point to that gives that kind of a difference in mortality outcomes. So, Meaning in life is a good thing. But what about people with PD? Study of the role of meaning in life and apathy on people with PD. This is a study that I published about, I don't know, six months ago. And um, people with higher meaning in life have lower apathy in PD, right? It's a significant correlation between those two variables. And it's really the first one of the first studies that shows a, a direct relationship of something that can decrease apathy, because we just haven't seen that yet. So um, that was the first time it's been done in PD. And so the question becomes, you can show us that meaning in life helps apathy. We know from the definition from demoralization that one of the things that occurs is you lose meaning. You lose this existential uh, value for life and what you're looking for. So I, the big question now is, that's great that you can show this relationship, but how do I get more meaning in my life, right? You can't take a pill. So what do we do? Makes sense. We work on relationships, right? Do you have relationships in your life that are meaningful? People that care about you, people whom you care about, people that you do things with for fun. If not, one of the best things to do is cultivate that, re-engage exercise groups, uh, support groups. There are all kinds of things that go on uh, in the PD community that you can get involved with. If you have a religious or spiritual side of your life, work on improving that, right? We know the literature, again, is clear um, that people who have a stronger spiritual connection have more meaning in life. Work and occupation, right? We talked about that. Not everybody can, you can't just necessarily decide, I'm going to go back to work now. But work doesn't always mean paid employment. Work can be volunteering. My mom volunteers one day a week at a homeless shelter up near DC, where she they have a, uh, a store in there. People come and donate things, and they can be bought for very little. So people who don't have much can come in there and she just loves it. She gets to interact with people during the day and it keeps her from just sitting at home. And so it's finding something that you can do that you can engage in. People work on their health. People spend time in nature. What about an education? Is there something you want to learn? Doesn't necessarily mean going back to school. It might mean taking a class on photography. It might mean taking a class on pottery. Finding something that can help you improve an area of your life. Involvement in the community, right? Organizations and activities. Local PD support groups, right? What about hobbies? Any hobby you have, playing golf, going for walks, um, going out on a boat, right? Any of those things that you enjoy, if you dig into those more, they're associated with more meaning. So according to Frankel, right, he's the guy that developed this whole construct of meaning in life. He says you, you develop meaning by three things. 
creating a work or doing a deed, experiencing something or encountering someone, and by the attitude we take towards unavoidable suffering. So just doing something, right? Creating something new, creating a relationship, creating a, 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 a doing an activity where you create something that you bring home, you paint a picture, you do a pottery, uh, something like that. And while you're doing that, you frequently will experience interactions with other people. So not you're creating, now you're experiencing. And those things likely will change your attitude. Frankel said you can take away everything from a man except his ability to choose his attitude in any situation, right? It's one thing that we have total control over in our lives is the attitude that we take. And we can choose to be positive or negative. So the action steps. So I talked about those areas, right? Spirituality, relationships, work, health, um, all of those things. Begin to think about how are things going in each of those areas in my life? Am I being fulfilled in those things? Um, could I improve them? If you think you can, then that's an area to begin to focus on, especially if it's something that's of interest to you. You know, if pottery is not an interest of yours and you don't have any desire to do it, I bet doing pottery is probably not going to improve your meaning in life, right? Pick something that you can do that you say, I really like that. Maybe it's helping someone else do something. You know, maybe it's volunteering your time to help someone who has it worse than you do. And you say, I'm going to be a support person for them. You know, I don't know. There, there are a lot of things we can do. And then do more of what you find meaningful. If helping others makes you feel good and it gives your life meaning, do more of it, right? In the counseling world, that's called solution-focused counseling, right? You find things that have worked for you in the past and you do them again. And if you're doing something that's not working for you, stop, right? right? It's not rocket science to figure that out that if I'm having fun and I'm enjoying it, I really want to do it. So find those things. Engage with other people. Something happens to our brains when we engage in activities we enjoy with other people. It almost, it's like it compounds, right? Exercising by yourself can be monotonous, right? I talk to my mom about it all the time. She hates going to the gym. And I say, mom, you got to do something. I don't care what you do, but you got to move. And it's funny how she doesn't hate it as bad when people that she knows are going to meet her there. Or when she's going with my dad, I've been on my dad. I said, dad, you can't tell mom to go to the gym and you don't go. I said, it doesn't work that way. You've got to show up too. And so I, I, I tell you that we've probably got care partners on this call. If you want your care partner to be involved in activities, do it with them, right? You love each other. You have a relationship. Why not enjoy those things together? And you'll see that it's more enjoyable to do it as a couple or a group. And share your experiences. Talk to other people when you're in a PD support group or you're in an exercise group and you begin talking about things that you're doing in your life that are making your life meaningful, that are making you happy, that, are, that you all of a sudden you start feeling better, share about them. <clears throat> because not only does that remind you of what you're doing and how good you're feeling, but you can encourage someone else to say, I really want to, they seem like they're feeling really good. I want some of that. And then they can begin doing it. They might ask you, hey, would you show me? Yeah, show them, teach them, bring them along with you. Something about helping other people help your meaning, right? There's a relationship there. Practice regular self-reflection. Do, do I feel like my life has meaning? If not, evaluate why. What are things that I find meaningful? We kind of talked about that in the first two bullet points on this slide, right? Evaluate those areas. This is what matters to me. Maybe rank them. <clears throat> what are the most important things in your life today? <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's spirituality. Whatever it is, rank them. One, two, three, four. They're, more, they're important. Are you actively engaged in those? And are you trying to get more of those, right? It's, a, it's an important thing to do on a regular basis. Lastly, read inspirational books. I would, I would tell you to read Victor Franco. It's a book called A Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, it's, it's an easy read. It's two halves.
So the first half of the book is the whole story about his life in the concentration camps and what he went through. The second half of the book goes over a counseling technique called logotherapy, which he developed that helps people find meaning in life. So there are therapies that one can engage in, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, logotherapy. Typically, those things cost. And the other problem with it is we go back to apathy. And I've got someone who comes to see me and they say, Dr. McDaniels, I'm struggling with apathy. What do I do? Remember, apathy is low motivation. I say, you know what I think you should do? I think you should do 12 sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy down at the clinic. They're not going to go, right? Because they're apathetic. So here we are again. It's kind of like the depression and the exercise, right? Someone who's depressed, say, go exercise. It helps. They don't feel like it because they're depressed. So we've got to begin to think about how do we treat these things in a way that's not necessarily standard of care. And it's about developing things that someone can do in their own home by themselves. They don't have to go anywhere. They don't have to spend any money. You can sit at home on your couch, read a book and begin to think about what do I enjoy? How do I find meaning in my life? How can I get more of that, right? That's it. I, I, I kind of made it. I wasn't sure for a while if I was going to get there, but it uh, you could probably tell I, I enjoy this stuff. I'm fascinated by it. And, uh, you know, at least I don't know how you do this. I'm happy to field questions. Um, whatever's normal here. Great. Thank you so much. This was great. Uh, one, you have plenty of time. And, and um, if anyone wants to type in questions in the chat, you may do that. Or if you'd like to unmute, we can do that too. Maybe uh, we can stop sharing the screen and then we can oh, sorry. go back to that. That's okay. Yeah. If yep. you stop sharing, then we can we see can some see, people. See if anybody's got their hands back up. And stop share. Here we go. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank Let's you. Let's see what we have here. Any questions? So do you ever recommend that people get a pet? I would say that's not a bad idea, right? I think it fits into some of those categories, right? You could call a pet a hobby, possibly. Uh, you could call a pet a relationship, right? Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't substitute a pet for having interpersonal relationships. But I think that when you think about taking care of a pet, it can become one's purpose. My job is to get up every morning, make sure this dog has food that it goes to the bathroom, that it has toys, that it goes for a walk. Without me involved in this animal's life, things aren't going to go real well for either one of us, right? So I, I think so. I think that I, I would venture to say there's not much that someone could ask me to say, could this give me meaning in life that I would say no to? Um, unless it's obviously going to cause something negative. I wouldn't say going out to bars and drinking Drinking on Friday nights is a great way to find meaning in life. Um, could be, right? I mean, within reason, right? You go out, you're engaged with friends, you're interacting. So um, I think there's a lot. And I think it's a matter of finding what brings value to you and something that you enjoy that you're going to do. And it's amazing what happens when we begin to do that. So how do you convince how do you convince neurologists that their patient is not depressed but they are just merely apathetic? When this well, support there, Yeah, there, there are there are tests instruments that they can use to you know there's a Beck depression inventory and then there are apathy the apathy evaluation scale. Both of them are separate tests and neurologists can give each one and depending on which you score higher on that's what you have. But that's a good question because you can imagine apathy is the lack of motivation, right? The lack of desire to get up off of my couch and engage in life. But that's the same action that happens in depression. I don't want to be around people. I don't want to engage. I don't want to go to exercise. And so that's been a struggle for a long time is really teasing apart. Is it apathy? Is it depression? Yes right? The answer is kind of both sometimes that they have characteristics of each one. And frequently the treatments can be similar. 
I don't always think an SSRI that might work in depression is going to necessarily work with someone with apathy, but sometimes it's worth a try. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's a good question. And, and there's not a super answer to that. Um, when I talk to people who are treating this stuff, they say that's one of the biggest struggles they have is teasing those things apart. We have a question in the chat and it says, can you speak to how long it takes to create a habit exercise, for example? Uh, well, the literature says 21 days, right? If you look at how long it takes. So you exercise every day for 21 days. The literature says that's when you develop a habit. Now, I'm not going to promise you that that's the case, especially if you're engaging in Let's say you hate exercise and you really don't want to do it, but you make yourself do it for 21 days. You might get to day 22 and go, I tried, I'm done. Right. And I, I think the challenge, at least from my perspective in talking to people with Parkinson's disease is, you know, the fatigue is a real issue, right? With PD, we know this. And then the question becomes, I'm exercising on a regular basis and I'm not seeing improvements. So why am I doing it, right? And um, I, I think that that can lead to some demoralization, right? You're hopeless. You don't know, you're trying this and it's not working. And maybe it's the exercise clearly has uh, positive benefits for people with PD. But I think there's also that social component. It's critically important. Interacting with other people doing a similar activity and being engaged in life, we know that that promotes meaning. So um, that's a long answer to your question, but 21 days is the best I find in the literature and uh, for whatever that's worth. <clears throat> um, I have a question. This yes, ma'am. You talked about, okay, back to the exercise, because, you know, we are exercise people and yep. me being a physical therapist, especially and stuff, being a trainer, especially, but um, you, you gave the example of going to class three times a week and exercising and, and it, you know, wasn't helping. And so this feeling of demoralization sets in this inability to cope or yeah. the lack of coping strategy. I think to me, this is kind of a positive thing because if it's a lack of coping strategy, can we work on figuring out how to cope by creating a different strategy or a new strategy? 100%. So with yeah. So with regards to exercise, would you then suggest, oh, well, maybe you could try a different exercise class or once a week, or do you, you know, come at it from a totally different angle and suggest like, uh, you know, another hobby altogether. I mean, do we want to stick with the, you know, the apples and the apples or, or change it to oranges? Well, I, I would push, and you guys will appreciate this, to always stick with exercise, right? Because we know the literature on exercise is clear. I talk to the folks at Davis Finney all the time about this. I'm like, hey, we've researched this to death. We know there's no question that exercise improves outcomes in PD. Now, the one thing that, you know, I talked to my mom and she says, Brad, what exercise should I do? And I said, the one that you'll do, right? I mean, that's the best answer. If you hate biking, don't go join a class where they ride bikes because you're probably not going to enjoy it. You can probably find an exercise class. It might be chair yoga. It might be biking. It might be walking on a treadmill. It might be a walking group of people who go together, coming to a physical therapist and a trainer, doing some unique exercises that you may not think of doing on your own. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden you go, wow, this is really cool. I thought exercise was something that you just had to trudge through and hate. And I don't think that's your all's goal, right? Your goal is to get people to, people aren't going to come when they hate it. Eventually they're going to quit. And the, the goal is they see an outcome and they say, boy, it's working. I'm going to keep coming. Or they just enjoy it. And if they enjoy it and they keep coming, the outcome is going to follow. Right? And so I think that's, that's the toughest thing. But <clears throat> I think just finding whatever it is for you 
that brings the enjoyment. But yeah, you know, most of the neurologists I talk to say exercise five days a week. Um, I worked with a guy at VCU and his patients would say, how, how many days a week should I exercise? And he, his response was always the same. How many days a week do you eat? Uh-huh. And they would say every day. And he would go, okay, that's how many days you should exercise. I like that response. Um, I thought it was good, but um, you know, uh, that's kind of an up in the air question. Um, but I, I think that's a good question, Lisa, is uh, finding something you enjoy and sticking with it. Right. Uh, just another comment about that, though, is sometimes we feel like, oh, maybe somebody thinks that the class has become too difficult for them and they can't keep up. So so they give up and they don't want to come anymore. So if there's not another class available to them, they stop exercising altogether. In one of your slides, you talked about Frankel saying, you know, those three things and one of them being just um, experiencing it. Yep. Is there benefit for someone, even if they don't feel like they can keep up that day, to still come to class to observe or to participate from a social sense? Absolutely. I think there are two pieces to that. I think the social sense clearly is critical. But I think, what about participating some of the time while you're at class? And what happens is you begin to do, let's say you can only, you've got a 30-minute class and you can only do five minutes of it today. Okay, so you do five minutes. Maybe next time you do seven and next time you do nine, right? Your self-efficacy, your, your belief that you can do it begins to grow. You begin to develop self-confidence. You begin to feel good about who you are. And all of a sudden now your attitude changes from I can't to I can. I'm going to try, right? Because I, I think all of us end up falling into times in our lives where we just say, I can't do that. And I'm not sure that that's that's a fair statement. I think more often than not, if I were to push somebody on that, their answer might be, I haven't tried that yet. It's a very different question than I can't, because I can't means I've tried it, I've done it, and it didn't work. It's like me saying, I can't dunk a basketball, right? I can't. I know that. I've tried, and it doesn't work. Um, but it, I, I could say, I can't run a marathon. That's very different because just because I haven't done that yet doesn't mean I'm incapable of doing that. And sometimes that's the positive psychology slant on things, right? And sometimes it's just that little shift in perspective that makes all the difference in the world. It's I'm going to do my best and that's okay. So I, I think that's a, another great question, Lisa. I think that's really interesting that you say that you can't dunk a basketball. It may be that on a 10 foot high basketball hoop, you can't, Good point. but if you are on a trampoline and it's a lot shorter, it's really fun to dunk a basketball. So I'm a firm believer of you can do anything. You just have to find the loophole. Great point. <laughs> we have one, uh, another question in our chat. Can you speak yeah. to the role of sleep and diet and their effect on depression and apathy? Wow. Huge. Right. I think that, um, you know, most of the, there's a lot of conflicting data on diet and Parkinson's disease. I think mostly what you see, and when you talk to the experts, you come back to a Mediterranean type diet, a lot of nuts and natural stuff, uh, avoiding processed foods, things like that. I think there's also an association between diet and sleep. I think when you're eating a healthy diet, you're engaged in exercise, you're busy throughout the day, you end up sleeping better at night. So think about it in your own life, right? You take a Saturday and you get up in the morning at nine o'clock on a Saturday, you read the newspaper or you get on the internet and you read some stuff and you hang around, you sit on your couch all day and it's nine o'clock at night and you're like, I'm going to go to bed and you don't sleep well, right? You've been sitting on the couch all day. You've probably fallen asleep at some point if you're just sitting around. And so I, I think that then we get frustrated, we get anxious. Uh, then you start eating, you get up at two o'clock in the morning and you're hungry because you've been eating bad and you end up grabbing a bag of chips or other things that aren't really healthy for you. And now all of a sudden you're in this downward spiral, right? You're eating, your body's not getting the nutrients that it needs. You're not sleeping, getting the rest that you need. Your neurochemicals are all jacked up because of this. And now my depression is getting worse. So 
I think that there's clear literature. Um, I'm not the expert on nutrition. I just, I read a fair amount of Parkinson's literature. And I think that in most health conditions, there is a component of what you eat that matters. And the same thing with sleep. Um, and being deprived sleep will cause you to get depressed, um, be anxious with that. So my, my suggestion is have a sleep pattern, right? Whatever time you normally go to bed, stick to that. If you go to bed at 11 o'clock at night, most nights try to stick to that. If you get up at six in the morning, you know, and you're not working even on Saturdays, get up at six in the morning. Our bodies get accustomed to staying in that. And when we throw it off of that balance, our circadian rhythms get messed up. And then we don't sleep. And then we're in this pattern uh, of not sleeping and eating poorly. So there's a direct correlation between all of that and depression. No question about it. So were you being deliberately tongue in cheek at the beginning when you said demoralization and why you should care about it? Yeah, a little bit, I think. Um, I, I think the, the biggest thing with with demoralization is I think that most people uh, whom I've talked to about demoralization have never heard of the term as far as a medical condition is concerned, right? You kind of know what it is. And um, because it is similar to apathy, I think making the statement of why should you care? Um, because that's what apathy is, right? Yeah. I, I don't care. Um, and so, yeah, but I think that as you begin to understand some of these things that can affect outcomes in Parkinson's disease, may, you know, my goal for everyone is, is a couple fold. Begin to pay attention to yourself. When am I experiencing times of feeling down, depressed, incompetent, hopeless, helpless? You begin to feel those things. Start questioning why. What's changed, right? Maybe six months ago, you didn't have those issues and today you do. What's changed? And then am I doing the things today that I was doing the last time I felt good? And if I'm not, let's bring those things back into life and begin to get re-engaged with those things again. Because if you can't identify a problem, you can't solve it, right? So we've got to know what's going on. And part of that is introspection, which I talked about on one of the last slides, self-evaluation. How do I feel? Can I even identify how I feel? Am I, when the doc, you go see the doctor every six months and he or she says, how you been? I, you know, I don't know. Do you, do you know outside of your tremor or your gait instability or your slowness? How else have you been? How have you felt? Have you been engaging? Have you been social? Have you been lonely? Um, those are the things that really affect quality of life for sure. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. That was a great presentation. We learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, now we're going to add our spotlight. <laughs> for those of you who don't know us, um, I'm Stefan. That's Lisa. And we are PD Connect. We're a nonprofit in the San Francisco Bay Area. But you can join us virtually online. to te We teach you exercise and education Monday through Friday. Um, thank you so much um, to Dr. Bradley McDaniels. And we hope to see you again soon. This was wonderful. Yeah, thank you for sharing your research with us and uh, your passion. So right. hope your mom can join us in class sometime if she wants. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I'll send you guys my PowerPoints. You're welcome to do whatever you want. With. Thank you. Great. Thank you so yeah. much. All right. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Enjoyed Thank it. You. Take care. Come Thank back you. another time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.